What if I told you that Canada's Gripen debate just quietly crossed a point of no return, and it had nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with price, and nothing to do with NATO pressure? Instead, it came down to one company, a company most people associate with luxury cars, but which, behind closed doors, has powered some of the most survivable fighter aircraft in modern history. Rolls-Royce. Because while headlines were still arguing Gripen versus F-35, something far more important happened in the background. Canada's Gripen option just received a massive propulsion and sustainment boost, one that directly targets the F-35's biggest weakness. And today, we're breaking down what this Rolls-Royce boost actually is, why it matters specifically to Canada's geography and sovereignty, and why the Pentagon has gone unusually quiet about it. This is not about replacing the F-35. This is about changing the balance of leverage. Let's begin. Fighter jets don't fail because of radar. They don't fail because of missiles. They fail because of engines. Engines determine how often a jet can fly, where it can be deployed, how quickly it can be repaired, and whether it survives harsh environments. And for Canada, this matters more than almost any other air force on Earth. Why? Because Canada doesn't fight wars from desert megabases. It defends Arctic airfields, frozen runways, dispersed locations, and vast distances with minimal infrastructure. This is where the Gripen philosophy diverges sharply from the F-35. Gripen was never built to dominate air shows. It was built to stay alive when logistics collapse. And at the center of that philosophy is the engine. Here's what most casual observers miss. The Gripen's power plant lineage is deeply influenced by Rolls-Royce engineering philosophy, even when the engine is co-developed. Rolls-Royce doesn't design engines for maximum thrust at all costs. It designs them for reliability, cold weather resilience, modular maintenance, and extreme operating cycles. These are the same principles used in the EJ-200, Eurofighter Typhoon, the Pegasus engine, Harrier, and several classified NATO propulsion systems. Now, here's the critical part. Recent collaboration and sustainment planning between Saab, Rolls-Royce, and allied partners has focused on Arctic cold start reliability, short cycle engine swaps, local depot level maintenance, and reduced dependence on centralized supply chains. That's the boost nobody is talking about. Not raw power, operational freedom. Canada's fighter problem has never been stealth. It's been sovereignty. Canada must control its airspace without foreign approval, maintain jets without external software locks, deploy aircraft far from major bases, and operate in temperatures that punish sensitive systems. Now compare this reality. F-35. Reality. Engine maintenance, tightly controlled. Heavy reliance on global sustainment networks. Sensitive coatings and thermal limits. Long repair timelines in harsh climates. Gripen plus Rolls-Royce philosophy. Engine designed for rapid swap by small crews. Cold weather optimized tolerances. Minimal hangar dependency. Designed to fly again within hours, not days. For Canada's Arctic and NORAD commitments, this is not a small difference. It's <sighs> existential. Let's talk about one detail that quietly shook defense planners. Gripen's engine architecture allows field-level modular replacement. That means no deep-level teardown, no months-long depot queues, no grounding entire squadrons. In exercises, 
Grip and Cruise have demonstrated engine replacement in under one hour using minimal equipment. Now imagine this in Canada. Forward Arctic bases, dispersed highway operations, crisis scenarios where supply chains are contested. This is exactly the kind of capability NATO planners worry about because it challenges the centralized sustainment model they've built around the F-35. And Rolls-Royce expertise directly strengthens this capability. If this upgrade were meaningless, Washington would dismiss it publicly. But they haven't. <sighs> Instead, what we've seen is silence, vague reassurances, and renewed emphasis on interoperability talking points. Why? Because Canada gaining true sustainment autonomy inside NATO sets a precedent. If Canada can do it, others will ask why they can't. And suddenly, the F-35's centralized control model looks less like a feature and more like a vulnerability. <clears throat> Let's be clear. Canada is not abandoning the F-35 program. This is about options. Gripen plus Rolls-Royce influence gives Canada negotiating power, industrial leverage, and operational independence. Even if Canada flies both platforms, the balance shifts. Because once you prove you can defend your airspace without external permission, everything changes. The real message isn't aimed at Washington, it's aimed at NATO. Canada is signaling, we will meet alliance commitments, but on terms that work for our geography, our industry, and our sovereignty. And Rolls-Royce's role reinforces that message. This isn't anti-American, it's pro-resilience. Canada's Gripen story doesn't end with an engine boost. It accelerates. The next phase will not be announced with press conferences or headlines. Instead, it will unfold quietly through infrastructure decisions, sustainment contracts, and training pipelines that lock in long-term autonomy. First, expect Canada to deepen engine-level cooperation with European partners. This means expanding local maintenance capability, Arctic-optimized testing, and faster turnaround cycles that reduce reliance on centralized NATO logistics. None of this replaces the F-35, but all of it reduces Canada's vulnerability. Second, NATO will begin reframing the narrative. Gripen will increasingly be described as complementary rather than competitive. This isn't accidental, it's damage control. Once a major NATO air force proves it can sustain modern fighters independently, others will demand the same flexibility. Third, Washington will apply quiet pressure, not public resistance. There will be renewed emphasis on interoperability, data sharing, and alliance cohesion, all designed to keep Gripen's influence contained without triggering backlash. Finally, other cold weather nations will watch closely. If Canada demonstrates that Arctic-ready fighters with independent sustainment can operate alongside fifth-generation jets without disruption, the Gripen model becomes impossible to ignore. The real outcome isn't a canceled F-35 order. It's something far more significant. Canada emerges with leverage, operational, industrial, and political. And once leverage exists, the fighter debate is no longer about aircraft. It's about who controls the future of NATO air power. Canada's grip and deal didn't just get stronger, it got smarter. With a Rolls-Royce boost focused on reliability, autonomy, and survival, the conversation has shifted away from hype and toward who can actually keep jets flying when it matters. This isn't about replacing the F-35. 
It's about ensuring Canada never has to ask permission to defend its own skies. And that is what really changed everything.